Hi friends, it's Monica and let's review House of Sky and Breath. So if you haven't watched my reaction video slash reading vlog of House of Sky and Breath, I would recommend you to check that one out. So this video is being split up into two parts. There's going to be a general non-spoiler review discussion and then the second part is going to go really in depth into the different character arcs and storylines and there will be spoilers for this book in that second part. So if you have not read House of Sky and Breath just yet, I would recommend you to come back after you finish reading, but let's just get right into it. So this first part is my general overview and thoughts on the book as a whole. And I did divide it up into the sections that you will see the timestamps of in the description as well as in the comments below. Let's start off with the writing style of Sarah J Maas <laughs> compared of her young adult books and this being her now official third published adult book. So first off, I did want to say that Sarah did improve her writing immensely from obviously her first published book being Throne of Class. The difference is really really noticeable in the fact that it's reading more mature and more in-depth than her previous works and she has more focus on narratives and there's a lot more intricate detailings of the plot and the character arcs and i think now in house of sky and breath in particular there's less focus on just using swear words on the page and less steamy scenes like sure there are steamy scenes and you could swear and say all of those curse words but i think sarah's now focusing on actually maturing her writing which i did want to see one of the reasons why it was a little bit slower paced for me because of the more intricate writings in itself all in all it was still easy to digest and read throughout the book but going on to the pacing issues that i did have with this book and uh, some parts of that could still be improved and have less info dumping especially at part one in this book where there was a lot a lot of setup for the rebellion storyline so that made it a little bit difficult to read in terms of its pacing but overall it did result in a really well-crafted story for this second book. As well, another point I wanted to touch on here where the action sequences are still continuously great to read. From Sarah J Maas, they're very easy to imagine as cinematic scenes and I really love them. There were less, I guess, dramatic action sequences compared to House of Earth and Blood, the first book, but nonetheless, I did really like the battles with Hunt and his lightning abilities because they're really visually appealing in my head <laughs> while I read them. There are also some brief training sequences that Bryce practices with her new ability. I'm not gonna say much about what ability but she has a new one and I really liked that particular ability. So moving on to the setting and world building of book two. So after establishing the new world of Crescent City in book one. The settings and the world itself of Midgard and Crescent City were quite easy for me to dive back into. I didn't read House on Earth and Blood before going into this one, but it didn't really make huge of a difference for me to enter book two without all that prior knowledge or just or have not reread book one because i still have like that memory in the back of my head of like okay this is how the city is set up and how the power structure of this world works and it was really nice to get back into this world itself the one thing i did have an issue with about the world i think this is more about my own personal taste and not so much about the um, world building itself was the urban fantasy setting. I have previously read urban fantasy books and I really did enjoy them but I have not really continued on with some of those series. One that comes to mind is the Guild Hunter series that is reminding me of Crescent City and I think I'm just personally really used to fantasy worlds that don't use technology and it did throw me off at some points in House of Sky and Breath since I wasn't expecting so much modern technology even though I have read book one and it didn't really surprise me in that book but I don't know why in this particular book it just came up that oh I'm like oh why is it so technologically advanced here but it's an urban fantasy so I'm just gonna get over that but I am gonna take this dislike for technology for not having unique pieces of technology in Crescent City and in this world because I just felt that some parts of our world 
of earth we're just like copy and paste of whatever technology that we have now but i guess like once you get into that territory you might be um like dipping into sci-fi which is not what this book is so but i think like i got over it by the end of the book it was just like something that came up in um reading like throughout part two of this book okay so next we have romance and relationships in this book so the romance plot lines in this book were a lot to digest because there are a lot of characters and we have a lot of new relationships popping up, romantic relationships popping up. Sarah does a good job at distinguishing the different romances and all the complexities of having a romance and she doesn't spend so much time on the relationships part but of course in any book I really want to have good relationships and to see that unfold itself. And speaking on romantic relationships, Bryson Hunt as well as other characters' relationships, uh, we do see a lot of growth and development between those couples, as well as the general friendships and interactions between people that you wouldn't normally see interact in this book were really fun to read about and seeing how they would react to each other. And I basically call our main group of characters in this book the crew. Uh, which consists of Bryce, Hunt, Rune, Therian, and Ethan. And uh, their interactions are like full of banter when they are all together. And they all form like their own unique friendships with each other, either like previously from before book one even began. And it was nice to see how each relationship develops and everyone has like their own unique thoughts on each other since we do have different perspectives as well in this book it's told from a third person's perspective. Overall, I really enjoyed reading everyone's interactions with each other. Okay, now I'm going to be talking about some progression in the overall arcing plot lines. So we do have the deal with Danica in book one, continuing to have huge impacts in book two, and with Danica being quite mysterious because she has she had a lot of secrets that she kept from Bryce and from Fury and Juniper, so like from her group of friends. So it was really interesting to see how Danica's death still has a huge impact going on from two years plus after she died. And with that impact of Danica's storyline in House of Sky and Breath, we also have the rebellion aspect of this book. I won't say too too much about it because we do know that Hunt was part of the last failed rebellion and he was a slave for two centuries. The ripple effects of that continue in this book and to see how the humans are still trying to organize themselves and fight for their rights against magical beings. But with our particular crew of characters, we don't see the full impact of that, but we do explore it in this book. We do have our big evil, our antagonist, being the Asteri. So the Asteri in this book continue to play a huge role and continue to impact all the storylines, all the characters as well, because they are the big bad. <laughs> and you might not think they are terrible, but after reading this book, you do find out quite a lot about them. And it was really surprising to me of what they are capable of. And I want to learn more about what is exactly going through their heads and minds at this point. Because I think it's really interesting to explore like the villain side of things and why they do what they do. With the overall arcing plot lines in Crescent City, there is huge progression that's being made and <laughs> get ready to be shocked if you have not yet read the book. And what I think would be best going forward with Sarah J Mass and my expectations for this book series, I want more emotional impacts. I thought I was lacking that emotional connection to some of the characters this time around but at the end of the book I did find what I wanted and that was just to see that vulnerability of people and see that each character has their own multifaceted aspects of their personality and that really did shine throughout especially part three in House of Sky and Breath and with there being huge amounts of storylines and narratives being in this book and how complex the storylines are continuing to grow and develop into, I would like to see more of that. I still want to be surprised. I still want to be not disappointed at the end of a book. 
and to not have that typical experience of reading a fantasy book especially if like me if you have read so many fantasy books and stories that it's hard to find something unique anymore even though i am a fan of sarah j mass she does manage to bring different like elements from different familiar stories that i've personally that i personally watched or read before or heard of before into her own unique spin so i did really appreciate that and i do want to see more of that and with the themes of crescent city i do want to see more the impacts of the war impacts of traumatic events that happen for people and the commitments of people have towards themselves or their struggle their internal struggles because i really think that's what makes you really invested into a story or into a character at the end of this particular book i did fall in love again with bryce and hunt and all the characters that we come across some of them i didn't really care for but i think by the end of the book or even throughout future books you will develop more of a liking towards them that reminds me of how in the court of thorns and roses series that i personally did not really care for azriel in the first uh, three books and then that kind of changed in a court of silver flames because we got to see more of him we got to see more of like his story and he just had more page time and i think that will happen again with some of the side characters in crescent city and to build more of like my own liking towards those characters or even loving to hate certain characters that was a lot to talk about but if you're interested in now the spoilery section of this video continue on watching so the spoiler section is going to be my in-depth character arc and storyline progression and completely spoiling house of sky and breath and all the different secrets and twists and shocks and turns if you have not read it do not watch any further this is your last warning so let's dive in okay so starting off with the ophion rebellion a crew are now involved super deep with the rebellion and how the different characters when they first learned of the rebellion cause and how Therian is really the lead investigator and brings the news to our crew. So this discussion where they first were introduced to the their involvement to help out Therian and find Emil as well as Sophie. It was a really nice contrast to see with the more experienced veneer versus the younger, less experienced veneer. We have Hunt who was part of that huge rebellion with Sahar, which failed. He was then a slave for two centuries. He, of course, is scared to go into a new rebellion and especially with just getting someone that he loves in the picture, that he is at risk of losing everything again and he doesn't want that. His disapproval of trying to help out the rebels now is really well justified. And we also have Rune who also doesn't want to be involved with the rebel cause because I think he himself doesn't just want to uproot his entire life and fight for something that could potentially lead to a huge change in his world. As a character, Rune runs away from his responsibilities because of the Oracle's prophecy, I think, that he's going to be the last heir of his bloodline and or like the bloodline will end with him and i think that plays into this as well so it does make sense for him and this is versus ethan and bryce who are the less experienced in rebellion causes and with ethan he's a young werewolf he hasn't experienced something on a huge scale as this before he has in part of experienced deaths of close ones and like in battles before he still has that liking and will to save others as well as save humans as he did in book one in the demon attack on the city and he helped out bryce fight off the demons to save as many humans as possible and bryce being the person she is she's really stubborn headstrong and she doesn't like it when people who can't fight for themselves. I think Bryce in this case of actually being involved with the rebellion, she heard the name Danica and she's like, oh, Danica might have some connection to this. She, she's like, okay, say less. I'm going to be involved in this anyways because I need to find out more about how Danica is even involved in this because Therian found the emails exchanged between Sophie and Danica. So for her reason, it's really personal as well. 
So I really like that contrast in at the beginning of the book of even deciding to help out the rebels or not. But at the end of the book, they do realize that the rebels are not who they say they are as in terms of their values and ideologies, especially when Pippa is like at the head of the Ophian rebels. When they first interact with Pippa, they do see how she kills off innocent veneer and our crew does not like that. So they're like, okay, we need to not have these huge death mech suits and dangerous weapons in their in the rebels hands that will cause deaths to a lot of innocent people so at the end of the day our crew goes against the rebels and against the asteri and they're like okay we're just going to find our own our own way to defeat everyone so it's basically them against the world which is what i like to see in fantasy books and the difference in this book is like they came to that realization they had some hope in maybe supporting the rebel cause but then that wasn't the case so going on to my next point with the prologue characters so we have cormac sophie emil and the hind they were all introduced in the prologue which was quite a huge introduction to quite a pivotal characters and storyline to this entire book i thought it was different but then again it was really necessary to have this the storyline set up and that's where the pacing issue did start for me was from that point on because there was so much setup to be had and I did not feel like it should have had that much setup but it is what it is. So starting off we're talking about Sophie. Sophie, she is quite mysterious and you don't really know much about her except that she is saving her brother from the death camp and she is a powerful thunderbird and magical half veneer, half human and she also had vital information that could destroy the Asteri. So I think like this kicked off the entire point of the plot line of okay we need to find out what what is that information that she found out and she died for. I did really enjoy her character from that battle sequence that we had in the first in the prologue and even though the little time that we had with her I really enjoyed reading about her character. Then we have Cormac who is also known as the agent Silverbow in the prologue and we also have him as of the fae prince of avalon of the avalon fae he loves sophie and i didn't expect to love him so much he was first introduced as bryce's fiance slash betrothed and he he's just like really grouchy but i really like him <laughs> and he did end up sacrificing himself and exacting his revenge for sophie's death at pippa at the Asteri lab at the end of the book. He wanted to do right for himself and he did see the injustices of his fey brethren and the injustices of the humans being the lowest species of Midgard. And Cormac recognizing that was one of his strong points and I did appreciate how he encouraged Rune to be like a kind leader as the king of the fey and also helped out Bryce to learn about her teleportation powers. So those like were like small moments I really enjoyed about Cormac. He died in the end, but I think he did it for, of course, his own cause and to die for what he believed in and essentially be reunited with Sophie, hopefully. <laughs> and next we also have Emil who did turn out to be a human and not a Thunderbird. With Emil, he's like the small character that has such a huge ripple effect for so many other characters and with him he's just an innocent teenager who who got rounded up into a death camp but he got saved i guess for him emil as a character he represents of those that cannot help themselves but sometimes would need some additional help from external sources and that came in the form of bryce and bryce here really showed off her her heart in that she really cares about those who cannot help themselves. She also thought of Emil as a person himself and not just as a tool of destruction. So talking about Bryce and Hunt, okay, I'm gonna first talk about Bryce and Hunt as individuals and then going on to their relationship. So Bryce, our main character, she is so feisty. She will do anything to protect everyone she loves. She does in such a way that will be quite defined to the society that she's in, especially for the Fae society. And with her development throughout this book, she shows that she has a lot of grit, willpower to do what is right or what she believes is right. 
and as a person overall in this book she does develop more of an understanding of other people's perspectives especially of that of Hunt's because he has a lot more life experience than her. That doesn't take away from Bryce's character journey and her own progression to become more mature in herself. Bryce does grow into her powers and learning of what it means to be a starborn fae. She reluctantly <laughs> uses her royal title and now she's actually officially a princess of the fae. Her struggles of with her identity and not having her father control her was a really nice contrast to see in this book because she's so headstrong, right? But then she continues to be defiant to that uh, fae side of herself. She does find a way to overcome that by saying to the Autumn King that, screw you, I'm not, not going to follow what you want me to do. I'll follow along, but Bryce, at the end of the day, she will do what she wants to do. And my heart just broke at the end of the book when she's found alone in the world and she's like separated from Hunt, I'm like, ah, cannot wait for the next book. I need that next book. Now talking about Hunt, Hunt is a really complex character as well. He's dealing with a lot, a lot of his past traumas, especially being a slave for centuries and he continues to struggle to see from Bryce's point of view at times. With Hunt, he's overprotective, he's an alpha hole. At the same time, Hunt is able to recognize that people have their own opinions and their own experience of where they come from and he does do quite well in that regard. His own growth in terms of, okay, let's join this rebellion and see what happens from there. He's like, let's focus on right now and stop thinking about what could happen and what might happen, but let's focus on the now. And that thought came to mind when Bryce and Hunt were talking about, I think before they went into the archives of what could possibly happen. But Hunt was the one to say, we will be the, in this together and we will always be in this together. I really do love Hunt. He's a great character and he displays so many qualities of, of being a good person despite his tragic past. And going on to Bryce and Hunt as a couple, they had so much chemistry in book one. <laughs> but then again, going into book two, I think it was just the distance of them being like, will they, won't they? And then, oh my gosh, um, I don't know if I'm going to be with you anymore. Or like, when will we take this relationship to the next stage? Them finally admitting that they have feelings for each other and Bryce was dealing with her own healing as well at this time at the beginning of the book and it's slowly then translating to them being together and declaring themselves as mates and really growing in their emotional vulnerability connecting with each other on a more deeper level aside from the physical when those particular scenes came up it made the relationship seem so much more stronger in my eyes and when their powers are working together they're at their most powerful <laughs> as well as their strongest when they are together so them apart sucks because that's what we're gonna get for the future books but i think they will come together and realize whatever may happen to either one of them they will find their way back to each other which is so sweet i really like that in books and sarah does not disappoint with that with bryson hunt okay we're going to talk about rune now rune has a lot of different things going on for him so rune is the valbaran crown prince he's quite reluctant to be the crown prince he doesn't really want to be the next king he's a really huge partier he has two best friends flynn and declan i think with rune we see more of his character going on the arc of figuring out of what he wants to do <laughs> what is his next move what are his next priorities mainly for rune in this book um, I'm going to focus on the storyline of him and Agent Daybright, of which he then connects through Cormac as an introductory. And Rune uses his telepathic abilities to connect with Agent Daybright, who is an Ophian rebel who has like insider information and Agent Daybright really works closely with the Asteri. Agent Daybright and Rune, they connect to each other through First, the, there's this crystal calm that allows them to just speak to each other like mind to mind. But with 
I think Rune's maybe telepathic abilities, he is able to not require the use of the crystal and still contact the agent. So while Rune is sleeping, he manages to create like a mind bridge between Agent Daybright and himself and they grow to have like a literal mind connection and that might speak to them being mates but that remains to be seen. With each contact, they grow to learn one of another and Agent Daybright is saying to Rune that you're really young and this is not typical behavior of a agent of the rebels. But with that, they grow in their relationship throughout their connections and their conversations with each other. They eventually develop feelings for each other. And at the pinnacle of the relationship, they both agree to meet each other in person at the masquerade ball near the fountain at, at midnight. But once Rune gets there, he realizes that it's the harpy there and he's like, day? But like, and the harpy doesn't say night back to him, so that's not Agent Daybright. But later on, we find out when Rune is in the Asteri dungeons and the harpy is about to like slice his throat as torture, that the hind comes and stops the harpy and kills the harpy before uh, she touches Rune and injures him. That was a huge shocker to me that the hind and who is also known as agent daybright and also known as lydia servos that she's the one that rune has been talking to all this time so with rune and i guess with his relationship with lydia it's a huge shocker to him he was always advocating for doing what is right but also at the same time he's being cautious of what's coming and what can be done that reveal was incredibly shocking to me. I should have picked up on it, but like I didn't because it's like she's a double agent. So she's having one face or one mask to the Asteri and all the rebels and being that cold person known as the Hind. She has her true self that she has shown to Rune. And why I'm really talking a lot about this because their relationship will be quite reminiscent of what I thought would be um, Danica and Baxian's relationship would be like because they're both enemies and oh gosh it's gonna be so much good attention and contention between them and oh it's gonna be so so complex for them and I think just in terms of Rue not being able to trust Lydia because of of course of what the hind is known for and being ruthless and literally killing uh I think maybe hundreds or thousands of people that she's she can't be trusted but then he also has an emotional connection to her it's literally like the tv show love is blind <laughs> love is blind is like the concept of you talk to someone through a wall you gain an emotional connection with them without ever seeing their face and their physical appearance and this is kind of reminiscent of that for Lydia and Rune that just makes me laugh right now because it's such a good comparison. Groon also with his relationship with Bryce is really touching to me. He's very sweet to her and reminds her that you are worth it and I'm glad to have had the time I've spent with you when they're literally being torn apart from each other at the end of the book. Groon has a complicated past as well with his with the Autumn King because the Autumn King also tortured Groon as a child and he has his tattoos to cover up I'm assuming the burns and scars. We learned so much about Rune in this book and that he's not just the party boy who like sleeps around and whatever. He has another softer side to him. Okay, now going on to Rune's friends. So we have Declan. We don't really see much of Declan. He's more of like a side character at this point in this book. He is with Mark and he's a hacker. He's their designated hacker in the group and he's really helpful. Flynn, we do explore more of his character throughout the fire sprites that come about in Ariadne the dragon and we do see his really flirty side and I do see a little bit of, I guess this is like a prediction of Ariadne who was captured in one of the rings of, of the astronomer and now she's taken away into Rune's house and was freed by Flynn. Ariane escaped from the security detail she was supposed to go on with Ethan and Hypaxia. And she's now a Viper Queen's fighter in her like fighting ring. So I do see with Flynn and Ariadne that they will have like a bantery, flirty relationship. And because we did see little hints of Flynn being like, 
I will do anything and come back and get you out of here, out of the Viper Queen's place. So with Flynn and Declan, they're like Rune's best friends and they welcome in Ethan as well as Therian into their home and they're just like an equivalent of three best friends in a party house but they will do anything for each other. And I, and I do appreciate a good friendship group like that. So next character I'm gonna be talking about is Ethan. He is the werewolf and he's Connor's younger brother. He has been disgraced from the pack by Sabine. And so he's been dropped off at Bryce's apartment for now until he moves into Rune's house. He's a complex guy. He used to be a sunball player. He had like everything going for him until Connor's death. And he has a huge heart in him. He wants Bryce to be happy since he's also secretly in love with Bryce for the longest time ever. I think Ethan's like really big softy. He's really down to earth. He's one, one of those guys who would be really receptive of listening to your problems. <laughs> and he would be happy to you know but i guess at this point he's quite closed off because of all the things he's been through i did like his struggle of finding out of okay i'm out of my pack now and i'm all alone but i don't know what to do from here but bryce takes care of him and like giving him a place to stay at and ethan eventually becomes part of the crew and he grows to develop relationships with Rune as well as um, Rune's friends and I think Ethan just struggles to find a place in his current situation. So Ethan is then asked by Therian to help out with the, the investigation to find Emil and Sophie and he was useful in that regard of using his were his wolf senses and so ethan is then struggling to find what is his next move what is his place now that he lost the, his pack even though he's now with um the crew and hanging out with bryce and everyone else helping with the rebel cause that he didn't think he would be involved in but i think that changes when he goes to the mystics with um bryce and therian to help contact his brother once he finds out that the that the bone quarter is basically a lie that souls of loved ones don't go to a peaceful resting place Ethan then discovers that one of the mystics in the tanks is a female alpha wolf so he takes it upon himself to rescue her or try to ask her to come with him and that was his new purpose at the end of the book. But in the epilogue, once Ethan finds out about Bryce and Hunt and everyone else that went down in the Asteri Palace, he's like, okay, I can't leave without this female wolf. And he manages to wake her up and the book ends there. So I think Ethan has found his purpose, but he also needs more time as well because there was also that part of him being in love with Bryce and it was so sad to see him being sad and seeing Bryce be happy with Hunt. He didn't really want to steal Bryce at all but I, I could see in him that he just wants have that relationship and have that family again and I do think he will become a prime, the wolf prime and beat Sabine. Okay next we have Therian. Therian is the merman who has like red flowing hair. I always remember that description of him. He's the captain of intelligence for the River Queen and he's also secretly engaged to the River Queen's daughter and we never find out her name. But with Therian, he's struggling again to find his place in his this world that he doesn't really want to stay in of being in the River Queen's service and he has no way of getting out of that situation. Like he's not happy with doing the investigative work, but he did exact revenge for his sister. And basically he's like a punching bag for the queen if he doesn't do exactly what she says. So Therian is one of the key characters in this book, I would say right in the beginning of the book, because he is the one who first brings up the rebel investigation to our crew. And he courts back and forth to the river queen of what's going on and he he investigates like bodies that's being found because of a potentially connected to Emil. At the same time he wants to be set free but he he has that constant struggle throughout the book of being in service to the River Queen and trying to get a way out of his service. At one point he does break up with the River Queen's daughter and they were engaged 
But then the River Queen's daughter was like, oh my gosh, my mom's gonna hear about this. So Therian runs off. He runs to the Viper Queen. <laughs> he runs to the Viper Queen and begs her to take him on as a fighter. And the Viper Queen's like, this is, this is interesting. So then Therian drinks the Viper Queen's blood and that makes him like subservient to the Viper Queen and he's a pit fighter. Same with um, Ariadne, the dragon girl. So that's going to be an interesting storyline for him. Therian is quite a vital asset to the team. It's like the connection to the water world of Crescent City and of this world. Therian does find out about the Ocean Queen and how the Ocean Queen rules completely differently from the River Queen. Instead of fear, it's actually with care. He's like, I could do so much better than this. So then he just leaves. He has his own internal struggles, struggles between being above and beneath. And I did think that he does desire not to be confined to the beneath, which is like the, the water world. And he wishes to be free of his confines, which he does find a way to be free of. Okay, now I'm gonna be talking about the demon princess and this theory. So the demon princess, we have Prince Aedas, Apollyon, and Thanatos. So we encountered with all three of them, mostly with Apollyon in this book. Aedas is one who was in love with Thea, the first starborn princess, and when Thea died, Aedas basically rallied hell, his world, to fight against Midgard and the Asteri because of Prince Pelas killing Thea and they went to war. And Aedas is the one who helped out Bryce before and apparently, and apparently Hunt's father also knew Aedas before from the epilogue of House and Earth and Blood. So I think with Aedas, he's, we don't see much of him. I want to see more of him. We had the false Aedas being actually Regulus the Asteri and I was disappointed in that. I do want to see more of Aedas in the book and see how he interacts with everyone but I don't- I think he's like more of a background character for now and he will have more of a forefront progression in later books. So Apollyon, he is the Prince of the Pit and he is contacting both Bryce and Hunt through dreams and saying like you better like prepare yourselves, prepare your power and I want to face you. I want to face your power as being um, the starborn princess and Hunt having his unique lightning powers. At first, I thought um, Apollyon was going to be a huge threat, but in a sense, Apollyon was helping Bryson Hunt to prepare for, of course, the impending war that would be against the Asteri. And he helps Bryce to like actually embrace her powers and teleport on her own. So in a way, he's also helping them, but also threatening them. I don't know what, like, what side he's on, so that's quite interesting. So with his stare, we only really interact with the Regulus. He spills all the beans about who the Asteri actually are. They are powerful beings, immortals, who are tens of thousands of years old, who destroyed worlds before and beating off all of different kinds of worlds for their first light, which is their food source and power source. And um, Regulus explains everything to Bryce that he orchestrated a bunch of things pretending to be Aedas and also um, advising them to go to the Bone Quarter to basically test out their powers and see like, okay, what can these pair do? He tells Bryce of how Danica got involved with everything in the first place with investigating her own lineage and her Bloodhound gift and how she found out wolf shifters are a type of fae and that what kicked off everything. Regulus acts without mercy and he doesn't care. He just wants more food, more power. And to get more power, he needs Bryce. And but of course, Bryce refuses. So he's one of those villains that are typically just evil. So the Asteri actually do remind me of the movie Eternals, how they are like celestial beings controlling every world and dictating each world of what world can give me power and eventually just grow in a, another celestial and destroying them. So I think with the Asteri, they're doing the same thing. They're destroying worlds, eating people for their power and energy. If the world is incompatible, they destroy the world. Those are the worldly characters that we interact with. And some other character arcs that I wanted to touch upon were, were Baxian and Danica. I did mention how I thought that um, Rune and Lydia or the Hinds relationship would be like. I do think that Baxian and Danica as mates was a huge shocker for me. 
I did not expect that and backseat I thought at first he was just trying to join a crew of characters just to help out the goodness of his heart he wanted to, to turn over a new leaf but it makes more much more sense that he has a personal connection and it did bring a lot more depth to his character juniper i think having her dance issues bryce called up crescent city ballet director to appoint juniper to be the principal dancer and that's kind of where <laughs> that's like the last we hear of juniper and with fury we don't really know much about fury still except that she's a mercenary she has lots of connections in this world in the asteri world um in panagira and valbara like she's everywhere like she has many many connections but we don't really learn much of who she is i did touch upon the bone quarter thing about how souls are not really put to rest souls are just being eaten again as second light for the asteri and it's just an endless cycle for the asteri to have a source of power and feed and I do think our characters will manage to find a way of getting a proper resting place for everyone and take down the Asteria. Okay, so now I want to talk about the ending, the cliffhanger ending that I really did not like. <laughs> I really don't like cliffhangers. So we have our Akatar crossover here. So once Bryce is in that portal and she thinks she's being transported to hell, but of course she doesn't end up in hell. She ends up in Perinthian and she's in Akatar in our beloved Akatar world. And she first is stumbled upon by Azriel. We're having our moment of all the Sarah J. Mass's characters in, in a huge crossover book. And I'm so excited for that. With the ending with Bryce and Hunt being separated and Bryce just being devastated at the separation, I just feel for her and I just hope she will, of course, get, manage to get some help from the inner circle. And I did like that touch of Bryce not being able to recognize what Azrael was saying at first and only Amory could understand what she was saying when Bryce spoke in the old Bay language, old starborn language and Amory was like I have not heard anyone speak that language for 15,000 years and I'm like oof all the connections with all our characters from past uh, Sarah JMS books are coming together and I feel like this part will be really really intense and it's pretty hard to predict what will happen but I do think right now my current huge prediction I only really have one huge prediction and that will be um, Bryce will get the help of Resend and uh, Feyre and all the other characters that we love already as well as uh, Resend looking really similar to Rune with like the dark hair and the violet blue eyes. Of course, I think they're related and the Starborn Fae from Crescent City world is actually the Starborn Fae of Akatar world. So I do think that's what the Starborn Fae land is, is Perinthian. And we also get a little bit of a teaser of Azriel's dagger. I think it's called Shadow Singer, but Azriel's dagger is actually the twin to the star sword. I just think everything's going to come together and we will get Hunt and Bryce back together, back into their world and maybe gathering up different armies from different worlds because with the horn on Bryce's back she could travel to different worlds and I really think that will be the case here and that they'll be able to gather up all the armies and go save Midgard and destroy the Asteri together. So that's my huge prediction. So that's going to be the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoy this in-depth discussion of A House of Sky and Breath. Don't forget to give me a big thumbs up, hit that subscribe button down below, and ring that notification bell to not miss any future uploads. See you all soon.